work. But I am going to post some problems to uh, that go along with what we're talking about this week on uh, heat load, uh, uh, heat transfer calculations, because this is a big part of, uh, of HVAC. And it's the most, uh, I think most HVAC engineers would say this is the most uh, difficult part um, of HVAC design, because if you don't know what your loads are, you, you can't design anything. You can't do anything that we've done already uh, in the class. You can't do a psychometric chart, you can't size a system, you can't pick out equipment, you can't do the fun stuff until you know what those uh, sensible latent loads are. And, uh, and they're very, very, very difficult. Now, they're not difficult mathematically, you know, we're, we're in the realm of applied engineering now. We're not doing calculus and you know, writing differential equations. We're solving algebraic equations, basically, and, you know, solving for unknowns and relatively simple equations. The problem, the, the, the huge challenge in this kind of work is getting the variables, getting the quantities that you need to do the simple calculations. The math is easy. It's the numbers that you put into the math that is, uh, is really, really hard. And the quality of your design will turn on you know, the, 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 the legwork you do to get the information. Uh, and a lot of it is you know, climate information, but also as much information about the building, about the, the architectural design of the building, and uh, how the owner or the client intends to use the building. Because that's all going to go into these all important heat load and cooling load calculations. Uh, heating load is actually not difficult. Not that difficult, and we could do that by hand, even for relatively complicated buildings. And the reason is that when you do uh, winter calculations or heating load, um, you, you're, 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 you're taking a snapshot of the building uh, when the, uh, at the coldest time of the year, and that's going to be on a cold winter night when the occupants are asleep or they're not in the building and all the lights are off and all the equipment is off, and there's no sun bringing in solar radiation. So basically, it's only conduction through the building enclosure and convection. Um, and that's relatively easy to, uh, to work with, to do the calculations. Um, and, uh, and then you can find out how much heat the building is losing and you design your heating system. You don't even have to worry about latent loads for the most part. Uh, a lot of design for winter time is done without even looking at the moisture content of the air. Um, and, and, and when you can take moisture out, you don't even need the psychometric chart. You're really only doing sensible heat calculations. Now the danger from that is that you can end up with a building that's too dry. And, and so in modern applications now, it's for larger buildings especially, uh, you will look at the moisture and how moisture is changing to make sure that the building doesn't get too dry. And most buildings, modern, larger commercial and office buildings, will have a way to humidify the air after it's heated. You know, but for residential or even you know larger residential or small offices, you may not even have that. It may just be pure straight up heating. The problem we run into is with the summertime calculations, the cooling load. That is a there. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask, what would be some of the consequences of if the air is too dry? I know in the past you mentioned if there's too much moisture in the air that you can have problems, say with corrosion or other, uh, say structural members. What would, what would, uh, what would the consequences be if the air is too dry? Would it just be uncomfortable for people, or would there be uh, structural implications? Well, your, sense? You, you, your, your nasal linings become dry. Uh, mm -hmm. Develop uh, coughing and uh, sinus issues, and uh, that makes your your whole respiratory tract more vulnerable to infection when it dries out like that. And, and the rule of thumb is not to let you don't want humidity going relative humidity falling below thirty percent. Um, and then in the summertime, you don't want the dew point going above I think sixty or something like that. Um, Generally speaking, year-round you want the relative humidity to vary between 30 and 60 percent, and 40 to 50 is sort of the sweet spot year-round. But it's really hard to control a building um, with a conventional air HVAC system, where you're humidifying and heating at the same time. 
Um, you could probably do that here in our climate, but in, in hotter, humid, more humid climates, it seems like much of the world is becoming that way. Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's actually tends to work better to separate humidification from sensible. And, and you have one system that its job is just to, get, to humidify, to provide a set point humidity, and then the other system kind of fine tunes to make mm -hmm. sure that the, the temperature. That's really the only surefire way to get both temperature and humidity at good levels. Cooling, it's easy. But uh, often, when it's really, really hot and humid outside, and you try to cool to a comfortable level, um, it's going to be too humid. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a challenge. Thank you. So uh, yeah, do you have any questions about the, the homework problems? Were they solvable? Yeah. It's a pretty the first one that uh, the, the, the air conditioning, the, the matching the refrigerator to the, the HVAC system is, is good. You know, good design problem. Um, and then the other problems. Yes, sir. I have a question about problem one. Basically, about what? About problem one. Yes. It's a conceptual one. Uh, basically, you had 100 degree uh, refrigerant going after the condenser. And uh, what happened? Well, how did it? Uh, is there an expansion valve that was provided? Uh, it went into the uh, heat exchanger, and we don't know what the temperature was. For the first problem? Yeah. Um, Yeah, it, it, it's going to go through. It's going to go through throttling after the condenser, and that's going to bring it down to the evaporator conditions. Um, so you're coming out of the compressor at 210 and exiting the condenser at, a, at 100 degrees, and that's subcooled, right? You're, you're subcooled coming out of there. Is it subcooled, or is it saturated liquid? I think it's. Should be. Is it saturated? So it's at 450 PSI and 100 degrees. Shoot, I don't even have my, uh, where's my? It's, uh, yeah, I think it's subcool. I, I don't have my, my uh, I don't have my pH diagram. Oh, no, yes, not, yes, 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 because it comes out yeah. of the condenser, it is subcool. So it's, it's the temperatures, because it, that's a big difference between uh, coming out of the compressor at, uh, you're coming off the compressor at 210 and coming off the condenser at 100. That's a 110 degree difference. Um, so I think a part of that, I don't know what the saturation temperature at 450 PSI is. Do you, do you have that? Uh, I don't have the table. Actually, maybe I have it's, uh, 120. It's about 120. Okay. So uh, yeah, 20 about 20 degrees, 10 to 20 degrees of of uh, of, of uh, subcooling is common. And uh, yeah, so then you would pass through the uh, the throttling device, and that would bring you down to the uh, the pressure in the evaporator, and that would be a, the, at a constant enthalpy. How about uh, the, the third one? Oh, you mean problem three? Problem three. That was an interesting... Combat inter aircraft pilot? Yeah, interesting apparel for combat aircraft. <laughs> interesting apparel for a combat pilot, Danny hose boots, yeah. long sleeve sweatshirt. There's no G-suit or anything. Yeah, and, uh, like there was other... <laughs> shirt dress. <laughs> sure. I was just looking at the clothing chart. So I don't even know what a shirt interesting dress lingo. is. Huh? Yeah. Interesting lingo. I've never... Yeah. Maybe, did they mean to say like dress shirt or something? I, I, I don't know. I just made it up. Oh. I was looking at the um, 
I've never seen pictures of like World War II British pilots like near the start of Battle of Britain. They're wearing ties. Yeah, yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, what was your optimal air temperature for number three? Fifty. I don't know if I did it right. I got about fifty. For which one? Number three. I, I got I, I got in the thirties. Did it say anybody get in the thirties? Like 34, 37? What? Anybody number three? So you said you got something in the fifties? Yeah. Anybody else? Everybody's quiet. Why is everybody quiet? Fifty, fifty something. To, is that, that common? Right. Sounds right. Fifty points. Okay, I have to check mine because I may have changed the. Uh, I may have changed the problem statement when I saw that. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Okay, because I, I remember doing it and I got like thirty-seven degrees. That can't be right. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's it's conceivable if somebody's dressed up really heavily like that, right? I mean, you got on piling on garments. I mean, you're not going to be comfortable at sixty-five. Um, and I think when I originally set it up, I found that the optimum temperature was 30 some degrees. I mean, that's not realistic, but when you're fl flying in a combat aircraft, I don't know. I guess anything's possible. Um, yeah. What yes? Uh huh. Uh, is the QS the QH for this cycle? Now that you say QL and the QH. QS. Well, the the QL will be the total. It would be the Q total, which would be the component because the evaporator has to draw out both the latent and the sensible components. Okay, and the same for the QH. Uh, yes. The yeah. Well, the condenser. Oh, right. When it's in when it's in heating mode. Yeah. Uh, no, no, you're right. I'm sorry. This is in heating mode, and QS is QH. Yeah, QS is QH. So in that case, we'd have to solve for QL, but then there's also the work in at the compressor, correct? The compressor work? Yeah. There's work what, wouldn't QL, wouldn't the, the evaporator part and then plus the compressor part have to be what QH is taking out because the compressor yes. is adding some heat? That's okay. right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So it'll be a fraction of the QS value is what the evaporator is yes. seeing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, this is an example of... What's, what's typical, common in the heating system is that uh, you're only providing sensible heating. Um, especially with a heat pump like this, you would need a separate system, a, you know, a system to produce warm water or steam, and then you'd have to mist the steam into the air after it's heated. For the humidification. For humidification. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's look at, at, at loads here. Um, and I have a pretty extensive set of notes now. I haven't yet posted them because I just finished them, and I actually want to proofread them one more time because uh, I'm working at such a pace now that I'm really prone to make mistakes. So what I've tried to do in my notes here, um, let me pull up this version, is, is fill in a little bit of gaps uh, left in the textbook, and, and in particular to review some heat transfer concepts going on. So we talked about this last time, what the, uh, the load, what loads consist of. Um, 
what goes in, what we have to take into account. And uh, we've got the internal loads from the people and the equipment, and then we have the outside loads from the, uh, from the based on the temperature difference between the inside and the outside. And in the summertime, we've got the solar radiation as well. And it's that solar radiation that really, really complicates our analysis. Um, so what we want to do is uh, we want to calculate what the We're going to do a load analysis both for the winter time and the summer time. The winter time being something we can do by hand fairly easily. In the summer time, cooling load calculations, we need to take we need special procedures that allow us to model the effects of radiation. And uh, and what happens here during the summer? You've got the usual stuff going on: conduction and convection, just like in winter, except the energy is flowing in the opposite direction. In the winter, heat is going out; in the summer, it's coming in. Anytime there's a temperature difference across the building enclosure, there's going to be heat transfer. And we can model that. Um, and then if there's air moving, there's convection. There's always air moving because of uh, even when the air is still, you have natural convection. And anytime there's a temperature gradient, one part of the space is warmer than the other, the air in the warmer part will be less dense and it will rise up, and that'll create an uh, airflow. And with, where, there, where there's airflow, there's convection, and uh, so in pretty much all of our heat transfer analysis, we include convection inside the building as well as outside. And the outside convection will depend on the wind speed, but in general, we just use two numbers. We use a wintertime number and a summertime number, and the wintertime number assumes a 25 mile per hour wind speed, against the building surface, and the summertime number assumes, uh, I'm sorry, it's 15 miles per hour in the winter and seven and a half miles per hour in the summer. So we just use two of those. Um, and uh, that's really the extent of convection, um, unless we're designing for a place that's really windy or on the top of a mountain, or something like that. Um, the convection part is, is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, conduction as well. Conduction depends on the materials. Um, most walls and roofs and floors consist of layers of materials, and each material has different thermal conductivity, thermal properties. So we have to look at the resistance to heat from each layer, from each material, and we have to add those up to get a total resistance for the building assembly, the composite building assembly. And some building assemblies are quite complicated. And doing that, taking the assembly and looking at each individual piece of material, would be very time consuming. So for standard assemblies, like different roof configurations, trusses, um, and, and, and wall, window combinations, um, you can actually look up the overall heat transfer data, heat transfer coefficient. Uh, in vendor supplied material or in the ASHRAE handbook, and you don't have to calculate it by hand. In fact, that's generally mostly what we do. It's very rare that I would sit down and actually do a, a, a conduction analysis, convection for a wall, because I can look up that wall and uh, I can pull that information down, or actually I just plug, plug into software the coordinates of the building location and I say, I'm right now designing a wall. And it'll take me to a database where there's just a huge variety of walls I can choose from. And I pick my wall, I can even build it. It's just like in SolidWorks. You, know, you just build it bit by bit, and every time I add something, it will draw the appropriate heat transfer coefficients or resistances. And then when I'm done, you know, I hit a button, and it tells me, okay, this is what your heat transfer is going to be on the design day for Seattle. And it knows what the design day is because it's already been programmed into the system. It knows that if I'm designing in the winter, this is going to be a day in December when the uh, temperature outside is about 28 degrees or something like that. It, it's going to do that for me. It's really, really nice. It's really convenient to have those. Um, roofs are even more difficult because they're often angled. 
how do you take, you know, how do you model heat transfer through surfaces that are angled like that? If that's complicated, you do by hand. Um, but software will do that for us, and there's even doing it by hand, there's shortcuts. There's ways to estimate it. And I mentioned some of these methods here um, that we can do when we don't have expensive software. And this software is expensive. That's why it's not common. You don't see it except at places that do this kind of work. The cooling load temperature difference method um, is, is a really handy, oh man, is that, is that a great method? Because every heat transfer calculation becomes Q equals the usual stuff, the U factor or the heat transfer coefficient, the area, and then you know we would have T on the outside, minus T, whatever the delta T is, that would be our heat transfer calculation. And that would be conduction and convection only. Um, actually, we can even model instantaneous solar radiation that way. But we're going to miss a huge part of the solar heat gain because that is not instantaneous. What happens is the sunlight comes through that window, and part of it hits, comes in here in its immediate heat transfer. And we can calculate it just as we did in heat transfer class for radiation. However, most of that much of it, and it's going to vary during the day and the season, but a lot of that heat is going to be, that radiation is going to be absorbed by the glass. Some of it gets absorbed by the glass, and then it hits the floor, and the floor absorbs part of it. And a floor like this is going to absorb quite a bit. And every surface in the room will absorb, remember abs uh, absorptivity? When, when it radiation, incident, radi incident radiation hits something, some fraction of that radiation always gets absorbed. And so it gets reflected, and, uh, and then it gets re-emitted. Some of it gets transmitted all the way through. And every material has different values for the absorptivity and emissivity and things like that. But what happens to that energy when it gets absorbed? That energy that gets absorbed, that is not cooling load right now. It's immediately. And, uh, and so you need some way to modify the heat transfer calculation to account for the fact that some of that, and actually a lot of it on a sunny day, hot sunny day, is not immediately translatable to cooling load. It's held onto by the materials that it hits. And that's what this, we have, we, when we want to take that into account, we replace this with something called the cooling load temperature difference. And it's just a temperature. It's just a temperature one temperature that you plug in and it takes into account everything. It takes into account the conduction, the convection, and the radiation, and it actually divides up the radiation in the manner that is uh, uh, consistent with the type of material, the type of structure that you have. And, uh, but when you use this method, you have to do it for every hour of the day. Every hour of the day. Um, and for every component, you've got an east, north, south, every side wall, because each wall is going to be, you know, the sun's going to be facing one wall, but it's not going to be facing another wall. So each wall is going to have a, a different CLTD. The roof's going to have a different one. So it's a very simple calculation, but you have to do a, an enormous number of them. And when you have situations like that, that's where spreadsheets are helpful. So you can set this up in a spreadsheet. And, uh, and, and then it becomes quite, quite simple. And another, one of the most difficult features, finding the right CLTD for your piece of equipment, for the wall or window or whatever. Um, and I'm gonna show you a, just an example of how to do that, probably on Wednesday if we, if we have time. And I might just skip it, because I actually don't think, if you go out and start practicing HVAC engineering, I don't think you're gonna use this because now we've just gone on, uh, on the computers for everything. And so this is not taught very often anymore. Um, usually now, it, what, the way things are taught is we just review heat transfer, we do some simple calculations, so you have a sense of what the computer is doing. So you can interpret the results, and you know what goes into the calculations, but the, the software is gonna do all of the heavy lifting. Nowadays, that is awesome. This is a spe radiant time series, is especially. Uh, I, I, I would, I would just assume. 
get run over by a car is to try to, to try to teach that um, or develop the materials. All right, so let's talk about the load calculations. Uh, space loads. So we're going to divide this up into space load. The space load. That's what we've been doing so far. That's the heat, and, and that's a big part of our job. Is the heat that's directly you know coming in from outside, being generated by people, and so on. And our system has to take that stuff out. Then there's what's called the system load. The system loads are the stuff that the loads that the equipment itself adds to the space. And uh, so things like uh, you know the fans inside the system. The fans are going to add heat. So all, all of the air going through fans gets heated. Like right? little heaters that are distributed through our system. But we need them because that makes the air move. But the most important, by far the most important system load is ventilation. You have to ventilate. And that's, ventilation is not taken into account when we do the space load analysis. Ventilation is taken into account when we look at the building code and oh, building code says I need 30% outside air. So then you have to think about, uh, okay, well, my conditioner has to condition the air in the space, but now I've got to condition this outdoor air as well. And, uh, and so you've got to take that into account. And if we've already done that. So we're actually ahead of the textbook because I, I, I teach a little bit different from the presentation in the textbook. We've already done you know outside air plus return air, mixed air, right? You put the mixed air through the conditioning unit. And this, uh, uh, actually chapter six for today, I think chapter six, uh, actually the textbook talks about that. We've already done it on the psychometric chart. Um, so ventilation and, uh, uh, and, and fan gain, motors, if you've got motors in, in the system, inside the HVAC system, leakage, duct leakage. That's really only a problem when you have really long duct lines. Like I've got a duct that's going you know, from one end of the campus to the other, and a lot of it's outside. So it's exposed to, uh, that's bad design practice to do stuff like that. Uh, you generally want to avoid long duct lines. And you certainly want to have well-sealed ducts so you're not leaking air out. Um, but we can take that into account. Um, but for this class, our system load is we're really just going to look at the ventilation part because that's, that's big. And we need to know how to calculate that. Um, we also have a situation where, um, in fact, this is most of the time, is our building is not just one zone. There's not one thermostat and one heated space or cooled space. Rather, we divide a building into multiple zones. So each zone will have its own thermostat and you know, the people inside can control the temperature and the humidity. And then you've got a big central unit somewhere that provides uh, heating and cooling to the whole, to everything. And when you're designing a system like that, and that's mostly what you will design if you do commercial and industrial design, is you have to look at each zone. And you have to do a space load on each zone, space load analysis and the ventilation for each zone, and then you take the, the worst case. You, 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 what you do is you say, all right, I need to look at this building. I need to look at all of my zones. So I've got five zones, let's say five zones. These zones are gonna be on different sides of the building, right? So one, one zone is gonna be exposed to the sun, maybe it's peak sun in July. Another zone in the building might be exposed in September. So they're gonna hit their peak loads at different times. How do you deal with that? Well, what you do is you, you look at each zone for every day of the year, and you, you, you find the peak. The, you, you look for each zone, what day does that zone peak, and what is the peak? And then of all the zones, you take the highest peak, the zone that has the highest peak of all the zones, and you say, what day is that? Oh, it's September 20th. All right, I'm gonna design the whole system for September 20th. So you design for the system where that, the, the, your, 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 your main zone there, your, your zone with the largest load, when it peaks. And then you add in what, what all the other zone loads are on that day. Now the other zones are not gonna be at their peak. But your design is driven by that one zone that has the highest peak. 
This is called the block load. The, the load calculated on that day, when your, 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 your zone with the largest peak, when that zone peaks, that's called the block load. And that's the, that's the load you design for. You don't design for, you don't say, oh, I'm gonna use the peak for every zone, right? Each zone is gonna have a peak, but the peaks are gonna be on different days, more than likely. You know, especially if they're on opposite sides of the opposite orientations. Um, so we need a way to identify what the block load is when we get into multiple zones. And uh, to be honest, I usually don't teach that. Um, it, it's a little, it's a little bit complicated, but it is the reality that we design it. And so I want to try to come back to it and hit that at some point. It's actually not that difficult. It's just a little, a different concept. It, it seems a little odd at first, um, but we start with just a, a single zone. I've got this one zone, and uh, I need to cool, cool that. And that's what we're going to do here. Okay, so uh, winter time, mostly sensible heating, and uh, we, we look at the outdoor design condition. We choose the design corresponding to a 99.6 or 99% cumulative frequency of occurrence, and I like to use 99.6. It's the safe, the safer. That means I'm going to design for a colder temperature. It's only going to be colder 0.4% of the year, 0.4% of the time, instead of 1% of the time. And in... Uh, Seattle, um, that's 26.6 degrees at 99.6%. Um, 30 degrees at 99.9% uh, at 99 uh, 99 of the time. December is the coldest month in, uh, in Seattle, so that's the month that we, we're looking at when we're designing our, our heating system. And uh, the winter dew point temperature is 10.5 degrees. That's pretty dry, 10.5 degrees. Um, and that occurs at a dry bulb temperature of 32.8 degrees. So if we're thinking about humidification, we would, uh, we would design our humidification system with a 10.5 degree dew point. That would be our outside dew point that we're going to be working with. Um, summertime. We need a lot more information, a lot more computational resources. We've got to deal with the solar radiation. And uh, the solar radiation tends to dominate other heat gains um, when the sun is out and it's hitting a part of building directly. And, uh, and then you've got people. People are asleep in the winter. In the winter design condition, they're out and about running around doing things. Um, and then you've got latent load, uh, often large latent loads to cope with as well. So a lot of our work, probably 80% of our work more, is focused on doing the summer, summertime design. And this is gonna just get more and more complicated. It's warming, you know, as, as, as different areas warm up. And I can watch, you know, this number here, this number's been going up steadily over, over the past few decades. Every four years, ASHRAE publishes new data on climate conditions. I mean, it's like a thousand data points in the U.S., and most of them are rising steadily. This, to me, this to me is the most authoritative source of information about warming. And you see, in both the dry bulb and the wet bulb temperatures, um, just about everywhere. There are some places that, in the south, especially on the east coast, that seem that's this isn't happening. And it's gradual. It's not anything dramatic. And it certainly it will help. Uh, it will help reduce heating bills. And uh, so s uh, computational tools are um, we're going to look at mostly there. If we look at Seattle. Our uh, our design day for summer design is 86.1 degrees. Um, so that's what we we do all of our cooling calculations. We assume oh, it's 86.1 degrees outside. And you know as well as I do, it's often hotter than. Well, you have to consider this is SeaTac Airport, so it's a little cooler than here. Um, we'd probably add a little bit for Bothell as you get away from the water. Um, so there are going to be days when our system is, you know, it's going to not have the capacity to reach. Um, but most of the time, we're going to be 
below, our system is going to be oversized. We're not going to be at that condition. Um, the hottest temperature uh, month is not December. Mean daily temperature. Oh, no, this is a uh, temperature range. For the, if we do this calculation, we need the temperature range on an average winter and summer day. The difference between the maximum and the minimum temperatures. Um, okay, so uh, we need to have our what our, establish our outdoor design condition. So that's going to be the 99.6 for me, 99.6 percent winter, 0.4 percent summer, and then our design indoor temperature, which tends to be between 74 and 78 degrees uh, in the summertime, more like 72 degrees in the, in the winter time. And then that, we can, we're ready to go. So then we do our heat transfer analysis. And what's that all about? Well, as we learned in heat transfer class, heat transfer can be modeled as, um, it's of course uh, driven by temperature difference across you know, some barrier. Um, and we want to know, okay, what's the heat flow through that barrier given that difference? And the factor that's determining that rate is the U factor or the uh, heat transfer, the overall heat transfer coefficient. And this takes into account all of the pieces that make up the material that we're, uh, that we're focusing on. And that's the area, the surface area. This is the area normal to the flow of heat. Usually the wall, the wall area or the roof area or the floor area. So we need to have a, a drawing of our building before we can do this. We want a good architectural drawing. And uh, so if you haven't learned it yet, Revit, have you heard of Revit software? Revit is high demand if you know, if you know Revit, um, which I don't, unfortunately. But uh, it is used for um, the design of the building. And uh, BIM, B-I-M software, building, is it building integrated? Yeah, I mean, we're moving to a way of design now where the architectural design and the h factor, the mechanical design get, are done together. It used to be we were compartmentalized. Now it happens simultaneously, a concurrent engineering of the mechanical, electrical, and structural systems. And uh, that's an important aspect of how we work. Okay, so uh, the U factor, how do we get that? Um, well, you can look it up. So that window, if there's a window that I can buy at, at, at uh, Home Depot, I, chances are I can go pull the spec sheet and see what the U, U factor is for that window. Um, and it was done, of course, under care, you know, careful conditions in a lab somewhere, but it's good enough. That's what we use. Um, but for other things that are not off-the-shelf items, um, like composite assemblies, I may have to calculate that. And if I have to calculate it, well, if I can calculate it, well, you get the U factor for the different components that make up the composite, and you take the area weighted average of all the little U, of, of, of the U factors of all the components, you add them up. Now, there are certain rules of thumb here. A wall typically has an insulated part and a structural part. The structural part will be the, the beams, or if it's a dwelling, residential, it'll be a wood, wood stud. You open up a wall and you'll see insulated panels, and then every 16 inches, 16 inch is, is a, is a um, a design convention for offsetting studs or placement of studs, 16-inch 16, 16 centers. And, uh, and then those studs make a cavity in the wall and you fill the cavity with insulation. Okay, so you have to consider that my wall, okay, I've got a, an insulated part that's gonna be resistant, highly resistant to thermal energy, but then I've got the structural part. I have to have that or the wall falls down, the building collapses, but these structural members tend not to be very good at insulating the building. They, they tend to let heat come through, so they will often mess up the design, but you have to have that um, to, 
pass building code and the, and the, and the B of the structure of sound building. And uh, so you might have two by four studs or two by six studs, I think, in the example here. Then you've got windows and skylights. Anything that's glass is going to uh, have its own U factor. Um, doors and their standard door, door designs, and you can look up their U factors. But in a typical residential frame wall, the framing members are 15 to 20 percent of the total surface area. 20 percent is and this is for just a residential, um, and maybe some smaller commercial buildings that use this uh, framing method. And so what you would do is you, I, you design your wall, I want this kind of insulation, and then I just assume that, well, 20, 15 to 20% of my area is going to be stud. So I have to do a design for that 15 to 20% that has stud in it in place of insulation. The rest of the wall will be the same, okay? For the most part, it's just that where the stud is, that's going to be a member of the of the wall instead of the insulation. Um, and uh, and then I I get the U factors. So it's just an example here: a 200 square foot section of wall, wood frame building. It has three windows, three feet by five feet. Okay. And uh, we've got U factors with UI for insulated wall. U.S. for the stud wall and U.W. for the windows. The overall U will be the weighted average, or uh, the air, not weighted, the area weighted, the area weighted average. Um, so overall wall area, 200 square feet. My stud assumed 20% for structural members, 40 square feet. That leaves 160 square feet, and out of that, I'm going to put windows. Three three by five windows, that's 45 square feet, and the rest of that wall will be insulated wall. Okay? So this is how we begin. We figure out what, what, are we, what areas do we have, what surface areas, and we break that down, because each of those surface areas will have a different view. So then we calculate the fraction of the overall wall area, that is stud, 40 over 200, Window, 45 over 200, and then insulated, 115 over 200, and those are my, my fractions. So when I go to calculate my overall U factor for this wall, it's going to be 0.2 times the U for the stud, plus 0.225 U for the window, 0.575 for the U for the insulated part. So that's how we, how we take care of that. Then I've got my U factor, and now I can plug it in and, uh, and the wall area, and it's just T, uh, this is winter, uh, T in minus T out. Gives us a positive number, but keep going out. Okay? And um, so here is, uh, we, we just throw some numbers in. Um, actually, these are real, real numbers that I looked up. Um, you see the U for the window is high. In, windows are not good insulators. Um, the stud wall, actually, wood is not so bad. I mean, you could actually insulate with wood. But it would be expensive. <laughs> wood is expensive, and so it's better used as a structural member than it is. You know, we can use uh, uh, materials designed for purposes of insulation fiberglass, for example, or urethane, and it has a very low heat transfer coefficient, which is what you want to resist heat flow. So assume outside temperature 20 degrees, inside 72, just for our winter design, and then we can calculate our overall heat transfer coefficient, and you can see how the window, those windows, just destroy the thermal integrity of our wall, or its ability to Tech. When you look at the, st the stud and the insulation, and then again, that window, those windows, so you pay for the aesthetics. You pay for the ability, you know, looking outside. Um, and then we plug that U into our heat transfer with 200 square feet, and you see we have 20, 50 BTU per hour. Right? So that would be our, uh, that would be, we've done a wall. Now we do that for the other four walls. And we do it for the ceiling and the floor, 
and you know done a lot of our got, got a lot of the work done for heating load, doing our heating load calculation. Now, many, many, most of the applications that we're going to deal with, you can look up U values, but sometimes you can't. And it's good actually to know how U values, how U factors are calculated. And that, they're calculated from the R value. And the R value is related to something you know from heat transfer class. Actually, we talk about U in heat transfer, but we also, early in heat transfer, developed the concept of thermal resistance. Right? It's like electrical resistance. And uh, when we write Fourier's law of conduction, we can write it in terms of the thermal resistance, the heat, the temperature difference over R. So if you know R, you can calculate the heat transfer by conduction. The thermal resistance is the dimension of the material, the, the length, divided by the thermal conductivity times the area, the cross-sectional area or the surface area normal to the flow. K is a property of material, so you know about thermal conductivity. We use that a lot in heat transfer and thermodynamics, um, but we don't really use K in HVAC. It, it's, it's rolled into R and U. And usually we don't have to mess with it. Um, in, the, in the worst case, we can look up R. We rarely have to go and look at K. Um, okay, so thermal resistance is known, then Q is easy. The problem is in building engineering, in building construction, we don't really use R. Instead, we use something called the R value, and they're different. And our heat transfer book actually says what the difference is, but then it doesn't really talk about R value anymore because that's, you know, building builders use that. Why, you know, we're engineers, not builders. Well, no, HVAC engineers use R values and more than we use R. But, uh, and the reason is that R, with, with R, you, uh, R has an area in the calculation, so it allows you to have variable area. But the R value is for a specific area of, of a wall or a material. So it's a standard size of something that you buy in a building place. Um, and it's, you can see it's calculated very similar to, to R. It's actually R times A is the R value. So the R value incorporates A into the result. And uh, so it's the dimension over K. Now, where we would use R, we, we would use this term here is when we're specifying insulation. Because with insulation, we, would, we, want, we specify the thickness of the insulation. Um, so the insulation will usually have a, they call it a conductivity. Not thermal conductivity, just the, the insulation is conductivity. And, uh, and then we convert conductivity to R value by plugging in the thickness. Well, I, I, I want eight inches of, of uh, fiberglass bat, or I want 16 inches of fiberglass bat. So I have to plug that no, the number of inches in to get the R value. And I'll show you that in a second. I think it's switched right now. So insulation is sold on the basis of thickness and area. And so the uh, properties of insulation will often be expressed in these non-standard units. It's actually the units of thermal conductivity, but okay, in heat transfer, we only use SI, right? This is watts. Heat transfer is in watts. And the heat transfer coefficient is, uh, or, or, or R is in watts per K. So that's units of R. But in, uh, in, 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 in English units, this is going to be watts is BTU per hour, and then we've got degrees Fahrenheit. So the units become more cumbersome, and it's easy to, really easy to mess this up. And um, since R value 
is R times A, then that unit is uh, uh, it, it, it's a square meters Kelvin over watts in SI, or it is in, in English units. It's a very ugly set of units, but it's what our most of our stuff is going to be the units that it can use. Um, so that's what, uh, uh, so that this, when, when we are dealing with insulation, um, the unit that insulation is specified in tends to be this unit here, where inch is put in the numerator in order to, that we can plug in the number of inches of insulation that we want, and then calculate the R value from that. Okay, so for the R value for insulation, we get the, 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 the conductivity of the insulation, which is in these units here, and we divide by number of inches, how much insulation we want, and then we invert the result. And that would be the R value for that, for that insulation. Okay, um, so if we're designing a wall or roof or something like that, we decide what layers that we want when we make a composite wall. And generally we want to make this, we want to have the greatest thermal resistance that we can get given what the client wants, you know, how many windows and things like that. Um, and the cost, how, how, how much is the owner willing to pay? So we're trying to maximize our R values. That's how we to minimize U factor, you want to minimize U factor, and you do that by maximizing R value, because they're, they're, in, they're inverses of each other. Okay? Um, all right, so we've got a million possibilities for building a wall or, or, or a composite structure. There are certain, there's lots of standard materials. Uh, there's, think of, uh, of, of the different walls, you can have uh, cement walls, block walls, brick walls, uh, uh, wood paneling, plaster, uh, gypsum, wallboard. All of that has an R value. You know, we can look it up in, in these tables in the textbook that give all these values. And for uh, for for components that you you have to specify, okay, how, how many inches, then it will give you the conductivity instead of the R value. And then you can calculate the R value by plugging in your desired width. Um, air gaps are also uh, uh, common in enclosures. An air gap is a type of insulation. And uh, wherever there's an air gap, you can look up, based on the width of that gap, what its R value is going to be. And its R value is going to depend on, you know, is, is the air gap vertical, like in a wall? Um, is uh, Yeah, it can, it can be in a wall like that, and, and, and the, R, the, the R value for air is going to be different when it's like that versus in an, in an attic, for example, if it's like that. And if it's like that, the R is going to be different if the Q is going up versus the Q is going down. So you have to be careful to, when you look up these values, to know what is the direction of your heat flow, and what is the orientation of the air gap? Sometimes the air gap will be angled, like that. And then you, look, you can look that up. Um, and the table in the book has a lot of different orientations of air and, and air flows. Also, you know, is there, uh, is there a, is there a, a, a like a reflective, is there a reflective material like the silver, you have silver uh, reflective coatings on insulation and things like that, because that will affect the emissivity of the air gap. And so all of these things you have to factor in when you, you look up these thermal properties. Convection, it's just another thermal resistance. So it's not even something that we have to deal with or really treat separately. 
Um, R value for convection is just 1 over H, where H, remember H? The convection, convection coefficient. Yeah. And uh, that depends on the air speed and the orientation of the air. Um, the higher the air speed, the lower the resistance. But generally, we just use 1 of 2, 15 miles per hour or 7.5 miles per hour for the outside condition. And the inside condition, generally for occupied spaces, we only use one value, 0.68. Hour, square feet, degree Fahrenheit over BTU. The winter value, 0.61, um, is used for top floor ceilings. When the heat flow is upward and in summer, the ceiling value rises to. So there's some dependence on the, uh, the orientation of the space. Um, on the outside, convection value varies with the, uh, the, the R value varies with the wind speed. So, 15 mile per hour, this would be winter, 0.17, and in summer, 0.25. And uh, when we get back to those in. Now, why do we want to know all these resistances? Well, this is where the magic comes in. Because once you've, once you've figured out what all the layers of your, your wall and your ceiling are, so each, each layer is going to have an R, and then you have an R for convection on the outside, and you have an R for convection on the inside. So you've got all these R values, and they're all lined up. What do you do with them? Add them. Sum total. So let's see how we do that. Here's an outside, here's a composite wall made from various materials, and we list them from outside in. And I just pulled these resistances out of the textbook tables, starting with convection on the outside. This is for, some, uh, for winter conditions here. So convection, 0.17. I have hardboard siding, 0.15. Vapor permeable felt, not much resistance there, but we'll throw it in because it's, uh, it's there. And then I have uh, plywood made from Douglas spur, half inch plywood, 0.79. And now I've got insulation. So the insulation is where I'm going to have to play around here because I, I have to decide my thickness, glass fiber, insulation, and I want six inches. So this is what I get from the table that says 0.29 BTU inch per hour square foot degree. So I just have to come back to this to convert this to an R value. This is a con conductivity. You see, it has BTU in the numerator, whereas these other, these are R values have BTU in the denominator. Okay, so the air gap, we've got a half inch air gap, and uh, mean temperature in that gap, I'm predicting will be 50 degrees. So I look that up. Also in our textbook, 2.46, plaster on the inside wall. Look that up, and then inside convection resistance on the inside. So that is my enclosure, or, or at least the wall, one of, one of the walls. So what's the overall thermal resistance for this wall? Just add, add all the thermal resistances. But first, let's get this insulation and turn it into a resistance, and I do that. R value of insulation, X over conductivity. So six inches is the thickness. And I take that conductivity, put it in the denominator, divide it out, and there's my R value for the insulation. And you can see what's gonna drive my thermal resistance. It's the insulation, 20.7 versus, these others are practically, you know, could almost ignore relative to the insulation. Now this is six inches of, of uh, fiberglass, well that's okay. Now we're up to like R30 for new buildings, for, for buildings to be green. We need to have like an R30 wall. Man, I think the, my house right now has maybe an R8. <laughs> I, mean, I think my ceiling is an R4. But it's just too costly. I've got a, this sharply peaked A-frame. Up that this, uh, it's, a, it's a Cape Cod, New England style Cape Cod house with a really steep roof and just getting in there to below insulation and I've just never, uh, 
But that, uh, yeah, so we're, dude, I could do a lot better. Okay, so uh, add them up. So that's what we do here. We sum all those resistances and we get 25.4, of which 21 comes from the insulation. That's not always going to be the case with commercial buildings and things like that. Sometimes you may not, you might not even have insulation. Um, or it's just not going to be as, as large. Um, but so there, we've, now we've got our total R value for our wall. The final step, convert the total resistance to a U factor. And that's easy. Just flip this, and we get the U factor for our wall. So 1 over that, so that total is 0 0.0394. And that is the U factor that we would then use in our heat transfer calculation. Okay. So that's for our wall there. That's for the insulated wall. Now, what about the structural part of the wall? The stud, the part that would have to contain if this residential, I'm going to have some structural piece. The stud wall design would be analyzed in the same way, except where there's insulation here, knock out this part and put in whatever the wood, whatever that, that stud is made from, the wood that that stud is made from. And that's going to be about six inches. Actually, a two by six stud is going to be about five and a half inches. So that's the number we would use. I would say, all right, I'm going to have a structural member. It's going to be 15 to 20% of this wall, and it's going to be a stud. If it's a two by six, It'll be five and a half inches. And then the gaps, you fill in with the insulation. And that's what I do in this next step here, is I look up table 5.5. Five. Um, I just picked a uh, Douglas fir stud. Um, and it gives a conductivity. A lot of times, you just get these ranges. And you're kind of scratching your head, well, what do I choose? There's just a range of values. And the rule of thumb is either shoot in the middle point, if you don't have more, further information, take the middle point, or the worst case. The worst case would be, let's see, this is, a, this is an R value, so the least resistance would be 0.95, would be the safe number, the worst case. I, I choose the middle, usually. Um, so I, I pick 0.98 here. Um, and now the stud, uh, you can get wood in different thicknesses. So this is going to be given just like the insulation. It's given as a conductivity rather than a resistance. So I convert by dividing. I take 0.98, or, or I take my thickness, 5.5 for a 2 by 6 stud, 5.5 inches thick, divide by 0.98 and I get 5.61 for my R value for my stud. Okay, so I've got a five point R. So now I go back to my original calculation and I just, I repeat that calculation, but I use the, the stud resistance instead of the insulation. See, all these, everything else is the same. The wall itself is the same. It's just where I have the stud. And then I calculate that out, and I get 10.32. And then flip it to get my U value for the stud. And now we can calculate an overall U factor for the wall. Okay, if my wall is 20% stud and 80% insulation, 0.2 times U for the stud, and U for the stud, we calculate it up here. Or the U, this was the insulated wall, sorry, 0 0.0394. And then for the stud, 0 0.0969 gives us an overall U factor of 0 0.0509. And now finally, to just make a, you know, take this to completion, if this is a 200 square foot wall, and it's 32 degrees outside and 72 degrees inside, I can calculate my heat loss is 
407 BTU. Bravo. So that's a so I'm losing sensible heat at the rate of 407 BTU per hour, and that means I would have my heating system would have to supply that amount of heat. You know, if that were the only heat that was being lost. So I would repeat this analysis for all the walls on all the floors and uh, floor ceiling. Um, and then for cooling calculations, a similar situation, but then we need to have to take into account the radiation effect. And that's where the CLT comes, comes in. We would calculate U the same way, but then we would use the cooling mode temperature difference you know, if we weren't using the HVAC software. Yeah, so that is, that's the basic part of it. And then there's some little twists that we're doing, you know, walls and basements and things like that. Um, if you're doing a wall that's below the ground, you're transferring heat to the soil. So you have to look at the soil temperature. Is how, how cold is it underground? And uh, when we do the calculation basically the same way, except instead of the outside temperature, we use ground temperature. And there's a little technique for calculating that. It's based on the, uh, what's called the AMP. That's the, the range, the vari variation in the range, in the temperature range of the ground. And it, basically in the US it's either, it's between 18 and 20 degrees. 18 degrees around here, maybe a little less than that in the Seattle area. Um, and, uh, and then we can, We have the U for our, our basement wall, and we can calculate heat loss to the basement. And we really only deal with this in the winter. We don't really deal, we, we can, usually basement is, is, helps us. It's a source of cooling in the summer, so we don't factor it in. Heat transfer through the floor, also a little bit different, because if you think about a floor, the parts of the floor that matter are the parts that are on the perimeter, that are exposed. The floor, the floor is, not facing, you know, it's not entirely facing the outside, only the corners are. And so we use the perimeter, the floor perimeter, instead of the area, uh, P, the floor perimeter, and we look up uh, this uh, F, P factor here, um, which depends on the, actually it depends on the struct, the, the, it depends on the type of wall that joins the floor. Not so much on the floor itself. Well, it depends on whether the floor is insulated or not. But it also depends on the wall that is joining the floor. So you can look this up. You've got a floor and you've got a wall that's meeting it. Is it insulated or not? You can get the FT. There's, there's a little table in our, our book that even shows an example. And, uh, yeah, and you've got exceptions. You know, if you have a cantilevered floor, you know, the floor is, what would be like a, a house on stilts, right? <laughs> Where the floor is exposed, then you would treat the floor like a wall, right? Or a cantilever, a floor that sticks out. I mean, there's odd, you know, little cases, but that, that would be the typical floor. Um, and uh, yeah, when we're dealing with windows, there's something called the solar heat gain coefficient that we can plug in that takes into account the radiation that is coming in through the window, and usually that will be included on the window specification. You'll get, you'll see the U factor, and then it'll give you the solar heat gain coefficient that you can add to your calculation. If you're doing it in software, this is done automatically. Um, yeah, that's your, that's your loads, your external loads, and you've got people. We've already talked about that. What are the people doing, and how many people are there? They're all uh, standing and walking around, you know, grocery store, department store. Um, we take into account the sensible and latent load. Multiply by the number of people, there's our internal load from people. Um, the bowl analogy. Did it design for a bowling alley? Um, 
the lighting, you've got to take into account the lights. Very significant in an office building, big, big building. And we got that covered. That's the heat transfer from electric light. It's all sensible. So just throw it in the mix. Uh, wattage. Total wattage of your lights. Um, how often are you using the lights? If they're on all the time, this is one. So you need to have uh, some sense of how often all the lights are going to be on. And I'm not, how often we just use one? So we don't know. Time we're doing this design. This is a factor based on the structure or the design of the light itself. If it's a fluorescent light, it has ballast. It has it has little things that uh, that that go into uh, uh, affecting the quality of the lighting and so on. And that you know you can look it up. There's, you look up tables, standard lights, your offices will have uh, this value in there. The wattage, you calculate your Q. Um, this is one for incandescent lights, so this is a value relative to incandescent lighting. Equipment, what do you got? What are you gonna put in the space? You got electric motors, um, you have uh, blenders and kitchen equipment, things like that, uh, stoves, bathrooms and sinks. Those are gonna add latent load, industrial machinery, and you can look up all this stuff. Electric motors, or something that we, uh, if we're doing an industrial application, but we also, you know, have electric motors in all over the place. Your kitchen appliances, all, everything is an electric motor, it seems. Very, very common. And uh, so you can look up by the horsepower, the rated horsepower of the motor. Does it, uh, is it covered? Is the motor uh, uh, covered or open? Is that an open design or a, a closed design? And uh, you can look that up and get the motor horsepower, or how much of that horsepower is going to contribute to sensible heating. Load factor is, you know, how often are you operating it. Cooking appliances, you can look that stuff up. Really important when it comes to kitchen stuff, is it hooded? Do you have a hood that is collecting the heat that comes off? That is a big, makes a big difference. If you don't have that, then you've got lots of heat cooking going on, you're going to have a big sensible load. So the table's divided by uh, hooded equipment versus non-hooded equipment. But whatever it is, chances are it's going to be in, in a table somewhere. And then office equipment, what are you going to put in the space? Um, These are some examples of sensible gain. We don't use the nameplate power because, of course, not all of that is heat. Some of that's actually going to run your Device, but there's a peak heat gain here that is the part that represents sensible gain. And if you don't know, most of the time actually you don't know what's going to be in here, there's a table that gives you an estimate. You're designing an office. This is how many uh, desktop computers per 100 square feet. You just use that number. Add them up and there's your equipment design. You have miscellaneous equipment. Got a table for that, microwave oven, you know, uh, coffee maker, dorm fridge, uh, you name it, chances are somebody's documented what its heat gain is or its contribution or to the heat in the system. Um, and then we finish up here with ventilation. Let me, let me take a break and give you guys a break here. Um, we're almost done. Ventilation is pretty simple. We just have a formula for it, but it's really important. Um, yeah, so, so is this making sense? It's a review of heat transfer, right? A applied heat transfer really is what this is. When you, you don't tell the students in heat transfer class that, no, we, don't, we never use a heat equation. Nobody ever writes derivatives and solves differential equations. We just use, everything is Q equals UA delta T. <laughs> yeah, maybe delta T log mean if you're designing heat exchangers, but it doesn't get much more complicated. So you can imagine, I'm going to give you a bunch of problems where you practice calculating uh, U factors and figuring out the heating load for a bunch of you know, hypothetical buildings filled with you know, weird people doing weird stuff. Oh, I got to look it up for a karaoke. I, yeah, I meant to do that before class today. I forgot. <laughs> Yeah, if, if anybody uh, just finds the, uh, the, heat, the heat gain from a karaoke bar. 
There's got to be one. Or Pachinko, Pachinko part. Okay, um, I want to tell you that a uh, 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 couple of announcements here. Um, Wednesday, we're going to have uh, a visitor, the, uh, the building engineer from 21 Acres is, is going to come to introduce the project options that she has at 21 Acres. There's three projects, and um, starting uh, well af after the exam, but maybe even on Wednesday, I'm going to actually pass out with the, uh, more information about the projects. So I actually still am uncertain about the projects that our people here have uh, lined up for us. Um, what they're thinking about. Uh, but they're coming in next week. So after the exam, we have the exam on Tuesday, and then on or Monday, and then on Wednesday, our building uh, HVAC people will come in. Um, our, our, uh, and, and talk about their system. And, and, and that will actually set up a tour of, uh, of our HVAC facility. I don't know that we can do the tour on uh, the same day, um, but if not, we'll set it up for a later time. So I, do you all have class after this one? Yeah. So it may not be possible. We'll see how it, how it goes. A lot of the class meetings from here, uh, from next week, or from Wednesday to the end of the quarter, there will be other people involved at some point in the class, so probably an hour will be me talking or us doing work together, and then the rest of the time we be a guest speaker of some kind. Some early May, uh, there's a, a gentleman from FSI Engineers who is a, a HVAC consultant uh, friend of mine who uh, does some fantastic, their firm does some really fascinating HVAC, not, not just HVAC, but whole mechanical systems for buildings. And they just did the uh, Coleman, uh, no, was it the, uh, the ferry terminal. Is it the Coleman ferry terminal? The Mukilteo? Um, on the other side, uh, where they have a new, and they use this, this really new, uh, God, well, it's not new, it's, a, it's more of a European design for natural ventilation rather than having mechanical ventilation that takes advantage of uh, currents. You know, there are really interesting airflows uh, around Puget Sound, and they designed the mechanical structure so that it, it actually draws the surrounding airflows in and through the structure. It's really just a cool, uh, I love their company because they have a, they're very socially oriented. They're, um, their engineers do a lot of work in the community, like designing uh, tiny homes. Uh, fascinating HVAC. I mean, if you really want to learn HVAC, you know, in, in, a, in a small system, simple, not so expensive, you know, doing a tiny home and you know, making a cooling system for it, that, or heating, that would be really nice. And they do some of that work um, on their own time. That would be a nice uh, capstone project, actually, doing a, building a tiny home. That way, I, I mean, then I can actually get involved. In, because I, I, most of the capstone projects you all are doing, I have no idea what you're doing. Because it's all stuff that I'm not, I'm not familiar with. You know, drones and robots and things like that. I mean, you know, I, it may as well be uh, medicine or something like that to me. But getting some good HVAC stuff like that, I would love to have that. But it's, it's, it's a little more difficult and costly to do those kinds of things. But anyway, um, okay. So, um, yeah, ventilation. This is really important. And, and this is something we have to do because the law says we have to do it. Uh, and it's, it's not really hard from a design standpoint, but it is going to cost the building operator. And this is expensive. And now with COVID and, and the uh, fires, things like that, you, there's more awareness of how important it is to keep air fresh. And remove stale building air, and, and also, you know, you introduce this ventilation air, you've got to clean it, you have to filter it, you know, in some cases, uh, treat it, yes? How often do they replace the filters, and how many filters are there usually? Oh, jeez, boy, that varies a lot, and, and how often, depends on the, the load, you know, how much pollutants are coming through. Um, 
at least once a year, I, I think. Um, but it's, to be honest, it's a part of HVAC I'm, I'm embarrassingly not up to speed on, as I should be, because it's not, infiltration and air treatment has just not been something that I, I can work with. But I think it's going to be, if people are asking for it, you know, codes are starting to look more seriously at it. ASHRAE is doing a lot of work. On, uh, you know, now we have, uh, we're starting to see more uh, ultraviolet systems being put in. And, uh, and yeah, so it's, it's a vast expanding. There's also a lot of garbage. You know, when I put an HVAC system in, in my home last summer, they wanted to, people wanted to sell me all kinds of snake oil stuff. And, you know, I, all you have to do is look at the chemistry of it. This is not going to make sense. Um, yeah, general chemical treatment. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not really. Uh, I would be very cautious about spraying chemicals into the air. But uh, ultraviolet uh, radiation or uh, very, very efficient filtration. And I think now MERV 13 filters, in the MERV, that has to do with the particle size, how small the particle it will, it will remove. But I think MERV 13 is minimum now for what the recommendation. That helps to remove uh, viral and bacterial particles as well as uh, smoke and things like that. Well, of course, viruses are going to get through everything, but they often, viruses cling to larger aerosols and things that can be filtered out. Um, the problem you run into with filters is it's a big pressure drop. So you put multiple filters in the system, you got big pressure drops. That means bigger fan. Bigger fans, bigger motors, more electricity consumption, bigger ducts, fighting with the architect to get the space to have the bigger ducts so you can have the, <laughs> the more filters. Um, and that's why it's important to keep your filters clean, replace your filters regularly, at least once a year in, in your household systems. Um, because it does, our, our household fans are not sized or high pressure drops, so you can burn out fans easily if, if you have clogged filters. And I'm sure my filters are clogged now. Um, our air is dirty. Have you, have you noticed? Have you ever looked at your filters? Um, I, I, I live, well, I, I, it may be worse. I'm, I'm close to 405. I can hear 405, uh, even with all my windows closed. Um, so all the Particulate that comes out of vehicles, a lot of that gets into my system. It gets caught in my filters. It, it's awful to look at. Yeah, do that stuff. Um, wow. I'm not sick. I haven't gotten sick yet. Yeah. So ventilation is is. Um, you know, there's kind of rules of thumb. You know, you're supposed to change the air a certain number of times an hour. So, like, you have a, a lot of, at least the original concept behind ventilation was uh, you want to completely replace this air, um, God, what is it, twice an hour? I, I, I can't remember what, it's been so long. Um, one air change per hour. Um, yeah, I guess that was, uh, Kind of old rule of thumb, but now buildings are much uh, uh, they, they're much more tight than they used to be. So you, you don't have as much natural replacement of the air. But anyway, ventilation, you know, ideally you do it naturally. And uh, so you, you, you design the building so it captures the, and channels airflow um, and wind and, and so on to, to blow through the house, and that minimizes your need to run fans and things like that. Europeans, that's how they ventilate. They're just all over that. Of course, they have an advantage because Europe is mild, a mild climate, most of Europe. But here, really mechanical ventilation is the norm. Um, and, uh, and there's rules that govern. You want to get rid of CO2 and odors and things like that. Um, there are also six priority 
uh, contaminants that uh, you have to maintain at a threshold. There's a maximum that is set by the federal government, including carbon monoxide, lead, uh, 10 micron PM10 particulate, and PM2.5, ozone and sulfur dioxide. Most parts of the country, this is not a problem in the building space, but you, you know, unless you live in an industrial area. For the most part, maybe carbon monoxide, if you have you know, combustion going on in the premises. Uh, so this is something we have to be mindful of, but the, the main uh, gas that we look at when controlling environmental quality is carbon dioxide. That's the measure of how stale the air is. This is people breathe, we're taking in the oxygen and putting out CO2. And um, there's a maximum allowable concentration, but that's actually really high, uh, quite high. And uh, generally try to stay well below, well below that. Um, and then the calculation, how much ventilation air do you need? It's, it's a pretty straightforward calculation. It's, as long as you know what you're, uh, you need to know what the purpose of the space is, and how many people, basically it's how many people, what's going on in the space, and how big is it? How big is the space? And uh, this is just an example, a small number of, of uh, examples here. A telephone closet, what is that? A telephone closet? I think a phone booth, back in the old days, I still remember phone booths. Have y'all seen a phone booth? Yeah. It's been a long time. Phone booths. Teenagers can do fun things in phone booths. <laughs> I don't know what, what the replacement for would be now, but yeah, so uh, transportation waiting. So warehouse. Um, you can see whatever the building is designed for, you look at how many CFM per person of ventilation will be specified. You see warehouse is pretty high. Um, office buildings not so high. And, um, and then an amount per unit of square footage. So you got CFM per person and CFM per square foot. And, um, and then you don't know how many people um, or even, yeah, you do this anyway, because the, the client, the building owner may say, well, I'm gonna have 40 people in here. And you, you, do, you look over here and you find out, well, you can only have 20. Um, what do you do? Well, when there's a discrepancy between what the building owner says and what you calculate here, you use this value. Or you use the value that, that gives you the most, well, actually, no. You actually err on the side that gives you the most ventilation give you the most ventilation. And you let the owner worry about, you know, there, there's not a law on how many people per, per square foot, but it's a recommendation. But you go with this value versus the owner specified and whichever is going to cause you, whichever is going to require you to make the most ventilation. You go with that. Um, so uh, that's the occupant, the default value if the, you don't know how many people, um, so the, uh, that the office space, five people, five people per thousand square feet. That's what you design for. And if the building owner says, well, I'm going to have you know, three people, go with five. That's going to give you more ventilation. If the building owner says 20, you better talk to the building owner. That's <laughs> not going to be appropriate. But anyway, that's a so once we get those, pull those out of the table, you just use this formula here. So that's the number of people CF times CFM per person plus square footage of floor space and CFM per square feet. And that's your total ventilation. It doesn't get much simpler than that. Um, and then that's where we, that's our outdoor air. From the HVAC engineer, that's out, coming from outside. That's our outside air that we mix with the return air to produce supply here. Yes. So in that equation, then just to make sure I'm interpreting it right, the second, the second uh, part is going to be constant based on the design, correct? Yes. Based on. Okay. Thank you. And then this is the number number of people. Yeah. Most of the time, I in ones I've been involved with, we just go with what's in the table, the number of people.
Okay, and uh, so those are some examples here. Um, and that's your system load. That's the big part of your system load. It's, it's load not coming from, not going into your space from the outside or from in, internally. It's by virtue of the system operation. And then you've got fan uh, energy from the fan. Uh, fan efficiencies, 50 to 70 percent on, on average. And uh, so 30 to 50 percent of the fan power is heat. It's going right into the duct. Uh, eating the air, and that's going to give you, on average, a two degree rise in temperature across, in a commercial building, about two to three degree rise in temperature as the air goes across the fan. So if you want your supply air to be at, you know, 58 degrees, you better make sure it's 56 degrees going into the fan. And, and, and you really want to calculate out what that heat depth effect is going to be. Um, and sometimes motors are in the duct. Motors are stuck onto the fan, and so the motor itself, you're going to have the electrical to mechanical conversion in the motor, and that's pretty efficient. 90% efficiency on typical, but 10% of that of electricity is going to get converted to heat. Uh, I think most fans, most fans are positioned outside of the duct. But in big air handling systems, um, I mean, there are air handling systems that people can walk in. I mean, they're so big. And those will often, the motor will just sit by the fan. Um, and then when you size your system, we've already done problems like this. You'll see that your, your, um, your, the, the supply air to return air, that line is governed by the the space sensible heat ratio, right? You run that line, and then if you know your return air point, and you know that sensible heat ratio, that's going to define your operating line. So your supply air, whatever the supply air comes out as, it's going to follow that line as it warms up in the space. But then you've got this other line, which uh, is the mixed air. This is the air that's entering the conditioning unit, and usually that's going to be steeper because it has it has the added work of dealing with the outside air. And uh, so this is our mixed air. Um, and so that's the visual representation of the system load versus the space load. Uh, that is, uh, that's about it for loads. You know, maybe we can talk a little bit about block load and, uh, and CLPD, but I think this is enough to give us a flavor of what goes into the heat transfer analysis. And you can uh, take comfort from the fact that when you go out and actually do this on the job, you're going to be working with, in all likelihood, working with software, HVAC software. Okay. Now, last time I gave, uh, I gave you a handout that had some practice problems. Um, now we actually have gone over the uh, what you need to know to work those problems. But um, when I was going over with that handout, I noticed that there was some uh, misprints and um, just a, a little sloppiness in it because I, I, I was writing it quickly. And so I made a, a new one. I'm <laughs> You want to take that one and throw it away. Um, I mean, the errors are, are minor, but I also added a fourth problem. Um, and I'm going to turn this into homework that you don't have to turn in. But I, I would like for you to do it anyway, because uh, this material will be on the exam. Um, but it stops here. It stops here. The exam on Tuesday. So. Take a stab at this, and I will uh, I'll post solutions this week. I'll try to post them by Wednesday, but I, st I still haven't posted the solutions for homework two. Um, I've got all the problems except the last one. But homework two, that took a lot of time to write the solutions. <laughs> Do you remember homework two? Yeah. That was a, I remember it one problem, and it was, it was lots of steps. How many hours I well I could have done it faster if I 
just written it out by hand. Um, and I, I hadn't even done the, um, I didn't even do the charts, the um, psychometric charts yet. But um, so problem one, remember that? So that's a solution to problem one. There's a solution to problem two. Problem two had the uh, calculated cooling. And man, that went to two pages of calculations to get to uh, all the way through. Remember we calculated the velocity of the air, the velocity of the air coming out. And, um, and then problem three, that was a short problem because it was just calculating the mixed air, the property of the mixed air. Um, that was a short one. And uh, in problem four, I haven't finished yet. <laughs> I still haven't finished solutions to my own homework. And that, this is very unusual for this to happen. I, I'm sorry that this has gotten, I, I, I just have a, a, a work uh, load problem right here at the beginning of the quarter, but it's gonna ease, it's easing up now. And I should be able to catch up here. Um, if I didn't this week, hopefully. So I'm get this done and post it. Yes, sir? So all the problems on the exam <laughs> yeah, uh, the, 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 the uh, yeah, I mean, the exam problems will not be as sprawling as the homework problems. They'll be more compact. Um, it is also possible that I could take one problem, it'd just be one problem. There would be one problem, sprawling problem, but it would have multiple parts, and that would be the only, but that, that's not usually how I do exams. I usually have more questions and they're just smaller, ask about more specific things. But there, there's only so uh, compact you can make a, a, a cooling load calculation problem, right? Because you've got to use the psychometric. Well, you know, I could give you a psychometric chart and say calculate the cooling load based on what you see on the chart. That's a possibility. But if you have to start from scratch and make the whole psychometric chart, and then calculate the cooling load. That's a, you know, that's a 30 minute, 45 minute, right? Three minutes on the FE now. What? Three minutes on the FE. Three minutes on the FE. Um, yeah, the FE exam, though, keep in mind that most of the test prep material is designed to give you harder problems than will be on the actual exam in order to prepare you. That's why it, it may be frustrating. It may seem like, God, what can I do? This is ridiculous. It takes me 15 minutes to solve this problem. But um, it's because of, a, a lot of the prep problems are to, to, to prepare you for something harder than you'll really see. And that way, you'll hit the exam and you'll blast right through it. That's especially true of the PPI material, like the Lindbergh. FE mechanical. There's a, a problem book that goes with the big, rep, there's the big book, the FE mechanical manual, and then there's a, a separate volume of just practice problems. And those are hard. Those are hard and they take a lot of time. For the PE exam, if you get the PPI material for the PE mechanical, they will have problems that actually say, it, it gives you how much time you should spend. And th there will be problems that will say one hour. They're intended to take one full hour to solve. And uh, I've done problems like that that take me three hours to solve. Um, but it's because I had to learn or relearn a lot of the stuff in order to do them. Oh man, on the HVAC, the mechanical HVAC PE exam, God, they'll give you a problem that has a. I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll have. Um, I mean, it'll have multiple zones, so you have to do a block load. You have to calculate ventilation for you know, four or five different parts of the building, and then figure out what is going to be the driving ventilation for the system. And then you have, um, you know, a lot of systems nowadays will have what's called an energy recovery ventilator. Have you heard of those ERVs? They're really cool because um, they help to save energy. And the way you use an ERV is um, you, 
you know, okay, let's say it's the summertime, you know, it's a hot day in the summertime, and you've got to ventilate, right? You've got to bring in 95 degree air. But when you bring in that air, if you're bringing in 100 cubic feet, 100 CFM of 95 degree air, you're going to have to exhaust 100 CFM of room air in order to keep the pressure constant, right? So why not, instead of doing that separately, why not bring those streams together? So when that 95 degree air comes in, it passes directly by this, you know, the 75 degree air going out. And that way, that 95 degree air gets cooled. It's a heat exchanger. Um, and they have heat exchangers that are only sensible. They will change this, the, the, just the, the temperature of the air, and they're also ones that do latent cooling as well. So that, that hot, humid air comes in, it passes by the cool, less humid air, and that cool, less humid air extracts some of the vapor out of that outside air. So you end up with maybe it's 95 degrees outside, it comes in at 89 degrees. And uh, those are really nice. And, and, and a lot of localities now, including the city of Seattle, mandate energy recovery uh, on, on commercial design because it saves energy. There's just no, you don't want to take 75 degree air and just dump it into 95 degree. That's, that's stupid. I mean, use it to cool and pre cool. But energy recovery ventilators are a little bit expensive. And, you know, it's a, it, they're, they need maintenance. But they also introduce com complexity in the design. You, you start throwing those things around in your system and you're doing hand calculations. That's what they did on the P. When I did the PH back exam, is I had these inter energy recovery ventilation things. And man, man, because it's a heat exchanger. You, you know, you remember heat exchangers, right? Doing the analysis of the heat exchanger. Put that on top of the psychometric calculation that we're doing, and, and then you've got it. You just want to tear your hair out. Just give up and go. Do karaoke, right? <laughs> forget, forget engineering and just bench out. But you do that after you. So. Well, I'll tell you what, there is there's almost no greater feeling in the world than walking out of the exam. Walking out. When I walked out of the PE exam, oh man, you've done it. It, it was, it's like, it's not quite as the high that you get after, you know, when you graduate from college and your last final exam. Do you remember that? No, you don't remember that yet, right? <laughs> I just remember, I, my last exam, it was actually, it's not an exam, it was my design project. I made this monster design project. And uh, I turned it in. It was the very last thing before graduation. I turned it in, and I remember doing that. My next memory was waking up in my car, somewhere where I didn't know where I was, and a car was pulled up on the side of the road, and I was just, I woke up in the front seat. And um, very hungover. <laughs> and uh, it's a very dangerous thing to have, have happened. Actually, I have scattered memories of what happened that night. I, I have these big memories of, of collapsing around a toilet, clutching the, you know that feeling. And uh, then my friends told me other things that happened. And I was like, what? <laughs> and, uh, fortunately, we grow out of things like Dewey. I guess we do. But um, I don't know. It seems like students are better behaved today than they used to be in my, uh, in my time. We're just considering consequences to it. The, yeah, the consequences now are greater. They're a lot greater. Um, that, that's true. Yeah, you get caught. Um, but it does seem like, and I have three daughters, to, to, so I, I have the experience to, to show that um, at least my daughters never did the... Of course, I don't know what they did when they were outside of my... Uh, but I, I'm pretty certain they didn't do some of the crazy stuff that I... Oh, yeah, I wanted to pass out these... Uh, Try and uh, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll find that you know they're not too bad. 
Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, what a, what a difference when I finished the PE, uh, the, the PE mechanical exam. My wife was there to pick me up and take me out to dinner. That's the, that's the way you want to celebrate. Oh, here, there is an extra one. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, another extra one. Extra, extra, extra one.